in the 1960s, it was discovered that it was actually possible to make compounds of the noble gases, including xenon. And one important example of such a compound uh, that incorporated xenon was xenon tetrafluoride, which has the following structure. This is interesting for a number of reasons, one of which is that this particular compound has a square planar geometry. All five of the atoms are in the plane of the whiteboard, and all four angles are 90 degrees. So we see that this particular molecule belongs to the point group D4H. And we would like to demonstrate the various symmetry operations of this particular molecule. We can align our axes so that the x-axis goes along this way. In this direction, we have the y-axis. And the z-axis is sticking out of the board. So one of the first things which we want to look for is the high order rotation axis. And we can see that there is an axis of rotation going through the xenon atom and that it rotates this fluorine atom to this one, this fluorine to there, and so on around so that we see that one of the symmetry operations, which is clear, is C4. So we see that we have a C4 rotation for this particular molecule. Not only that, we can also see that if we go in the opposite direction, we have C4 minus 1. So we have C4, we have C4 minus 1. And we also notice that if we do two C4s in a row, so C4 followed by another C4 right after it, the overall effect is the equivalent of having done a C2. So we see that going in the XY plane, we have a C2 rotation just as well. We know that we always have E, so let's put that for the sake of completeness there. Now it turns out that there are a number of other rotational axes for this particular molecule. For example, if we go along the Z axis, we have a C2 rotational axis here. So let's demonstrate where that is. So we have a C2 here. And because this C2 goes through a large number of atoms, this is given the designation C2 prime. We'll see how that is distinguished from the other C2s in a second. So uh, the unprimed C2 is coaxial with the high order rotation axis C4. This C2 prime is perpendicular to that. So immediately we see that we have a D4 group because we have a C4 as the high order rotation axis and we have at least one C2 which is perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. By the same exact reasoning, we also have a C2 prime, which goes along the y-axis. It goes along the wooden dowel here. So we see that we have two C2 primes that are perpendicular to each other and perpendicular to the C4 high order rotation axis. Now we know that when we have a D4 group, we have to have four C2s that are perpendicular to the C4. So we found two of those, and we can quickly find the other two, and I'll demonstrate where those are. If we have a rotational axis that is diagonal across the molecule, so let's assume this is our axis here, and then we do a C2 rotation. This is the C2 that we label as C2 double prime. And the reason why it's double prime, it gets a lower priority, is because the axis only goes through one atom as opposed to the three atoms which the C2 prime axis goes through. So the, we give priority to the mirror planes and or rotational axes that go through the largest number of atoms. And then we know that we have to have at least one more C2, and this goes along here. Again, this diagonal also, if we have rotation around that particular axis, which would be this axis right here, this would give us the other C2 double prime. Does this have any other 
important symmetry operations. But one of the most important operations that it has, which is a key feature of D4H, is it has inversion. So put this down for it. So we have over here, it's kind of for sake of completeness, we have C2 prime, we have two of those, and we have two C2 double primes. And we also have inversion. And we can recognize that we have inversion because if we start at the xenon and go a fixed distance to fluorine in this direction, to the right, that if we go the exact same distance to the left, we're also going to encounter a fluorine atom. So that fits there. And then for the other fluorines are also on opposite sides, equidistant from the xenon atom. So all the fluorines are in pairs on opposite sides of the xenon atom. This tells us that we have inversion. And we can chemically distinguish centrosymmetric molecules, the molecules that have inversion, from those that don't. The way that we do that, we will emphasize this later on, is we analyze the vibrational spectrum in both infrared and Raman. And a peculiar feature of centrosymmetric molecules, molecules that have inversion, is that if we attempt to line up the vibrational bands that we find in Raman and those in infrared, we find that absolutely none of them overlap. The, the band will either be in infrared or it will be in Raman, but not both. And whenever we see that situation, it immediately tells us that we have a molecule with this property of inversion, of central symmetry. Now, it turns out that while we can make compounds with xenon and the other noble gas krypton, the only halogen that will react to form a compound is fluorine. So it would be interesting to replace the fluorines with other halogens here to see how it would affect the symmetry. Unfortunately, those compounds have not yet been synthesized, so they'd be unrealistic compounds. So let's look at a series of compounds for which we can make those substitutions and the compounds involved are legitimate and important chemical compounds. So where we're most likely to encounter this square shape, the shape of the square planar compound, is when we have transition metal complexes, particularly of the elements nickel, platinum, and palladium. So I'm going to demonstrate with platinum, because platinum forms a wide range of very important compounds, but many of the same compounds or analogous ones could be formed with nickel or palladium as the central atom. So one of the first and important uh, ions that involves platinum is the square planar complex that has four chlorines. Okay. So this is the compound that we call tetrachloroplatinum, and it has the formula PtCl4, and this is an ion with a minus two charge. And we can recognize immediately, by analogy with xenon tetrafluoride, that this molecule is going to have the point group D4H. And we won't go through all the symmetry operations for this compound because we can just look at what we did for xenon tetrafluoride, and we get the same thing. But now what we'd like to do is to see how the symmetry changes if we make various substitutions to the chlorines. So for example, suppose that we were to change one of the chlorines to a different halogen of iodine. So let's change this to iodine. Now we want to see, in this particular case, what is the point group symmetry going to be? So now we don't have this compound anymore. Let's erase that. Now we notice that we no longer have our C4 rotation because it will take chlorine into chlorine, but would take chlorine into iodine. Since they're different, that doesn't work. It doesn't keep the molecule looking the same. So therefore, C4 is no longer a symmetry operation for this particular molecule. Do we have any other rotational axes? Well, You'd notice that along this particular axis, we have a C2. So it would rotate chlorine into chlorine. So we do at least have a C2 axis for this compound. So I'm going to show it going this way. So we do have a C2. 
do we have any other axes? Well, we have no more rotational axes that are higher than a C2. We have the identity, of course. But we also have mirror planes. So we have a number of mirror planes. One of the mirror planes would be in the plane of the board. So it reflects the top of the chlorine and the bottom. So almost as we take the molecule and fillet it, we assume that the atoms are infinitely thin, but we cut them even in half. And the top would look exactly like the bottom. So we do have a mirror plane in the plane of the whiteboard. We also have a mirror plane that goes north and south, right down the center of the molecule, and reflects the left half into the right half. So we see that we have four symmetry operations in this case. We have the identity, we have C2, and we have two sigma Vs. So we have two vertical mirrors. And we'll begin to recognize that when we have this combination of symmetry elements, the point group assignment is going to be C2V. So by making a mono substitution in the halogens attached to the platinum, we have reduced the symmetry from D4H to C2V. Well, now let's add another iodine. So let's put the iodine here. So in this particular case, we have a trans. So the two iodines are across from each other, just as the two chlorines are on opposite sides of the platinum. So we have a trans compound. And this is going to be trans dichloro diiodo platinum. And again, it's going to have a minus two charge. So we can write it. Co2 I2. You put it in brackets because it's an ion and has a minus two charge. And we're interested in, and this is the trans, trans isomer. So we are interested in what symmetry operations are present and what our point group assignment for this molecule is going to be. Um, we notice along this particular axis, we don't have a C4 because that would take iodine into chlorine, but we do have a C2. It would take iodine into iodine, take chlorine into chlorine. So along this particular axis, we do have a C2. I won't be able to draw that, but recall that that is where one of the C2s is. Along this particular axis, I have a C2. So let me knit that in here. So I have a C2 along this. Also along this particular axis, if we put the dowel here, again, and rotate along it, I see that I have a C2 in this direction as well. So I notice that in this direction, I have my high order rotation axis, which is a C2. And then I have two more C2s, which are perpendicular to my C2. So I can write it as two C2s perpendicular to C2, which is my high order rotation axis. And this tells me I have a D2 group of some type. So now we merely need to see what type of mirrors are present in this molecule. And then we'll be able to make our final assignment. The most important mirror to look for, since we've already recognized that we have a higher order rotation axis along this axis here, is if we have a mirror in the plane of the board. Because a mirror in the plane of the board will be perpendicular to the high order rotation axis, and that means that we have a horizontal mirror. And that's exactly what we have. And since we have a high, um, horizontal mirror, it tells us that we have the point group D2H. Now, one thing to notice about D2H is that any of these C2s I could have considered to be the high order rotation axis, and I would have found a mirror plane that was perpendicular to it. So um, if I assume that this was my high order rotation axis, there is also a mirror plane here, which is perpendicular to it. And if I'd assumed this to be my high order rotation axis, there is a mirror here. So we have a number of mirrors that are perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. So this is the point group D2H. Again, an important thing to recognize about D2H is that in addition to the other symmetry elements that it possesses, it also possesses inversion. So this is again a centrosymmetric molecule, and I'll be able to recognize that relatively easily by using the combination techniques of infrared and Raman spectroscopy. So now let's look, let's take our diiodo dichloro compound, and let's change the substitution ever so slightly and now we're going to do it 
in such a way that both of the chlorines are on the same side and both of the iodines are going to be on the same side of the platinum. So this gives us the cis isomer. So here we have the cis isomer. And this compound will be chemically distinct from the trans isomer that we had previously examined. It will have different chemical properties. And now we want to see, in addition to having different chemical properties, will it also belong to a different point group family? So let's see what we have here. Um, if I try to do a rotational axis perpendicular to the board, that would take chlorine into iodine, which doesn't work. If I try to do a C2, it would take chlorine into iodine, which also doesn't work. So there are no high order rotation axes that go through along the Z axis here that are perpendicular to the plane of the board. But I do have a C2 axis that goes diagonally across. So I go along this way and flip the molecule. It would take chlorine to chlorine. It would take iodine to iodine. And platinum is along the axis, so it doesn't, it doesn't move. It's not affected. So that shows us that we do have at least one C2 axis. Let's see if we can we have green here to, to show this. So here is the axis. And the rotation will go this way. And this is a C2. And this is my high order rotation axis for this particular molecule. I have two mirror planes. One is a plane in a plane of the board. It's because we have a square planar compound. We'll always have this particular mirror plane, so long as all the substituents are individual atoms. But notice that this mirror plane includes the axis. It's not perpendicular to it. Therefore, it makes the mirror a vertical mirror. And we also have a mirror plane which goes along here which again includes the C2 axis. And because it includes the high order rotation axis, that makes it a vertical mirror. The symmetry operations that we found for this molecule, and this is all of them, we have E, the identity, we have a C2, and we have two sigma Vs. And with those combination of four symmetry elements, we recognize pretty quickly, we hope, that we have the point group C2V. So not only does this particular isomer belong to a different point group, but now we have a molecule which is not centrosymmetric. So if I had two containers, one containing the cis isomer in a pure form, and one containing the trans isomer, I could distinguish them using vibrational spectroscopy. There are other techniques that would accomplish the same results, but there's probably no combination of techniques which can do it more quickly and more inexpensively. So that's a great thing to be able to do. So let's see if we can make some other changes in the molecule and see what the point group assignment will be as we keep making slight changes in our square planar compound. Point group assignment will be as we keep making slight changes in our square planar compound. Now let's try to do a more complicated substitution pattern. And in this case, we're going to include two chlorines. There are two chlorines. One iodine. And one bromine atom. So we're getting a range of substitutions here. And We've done it in such a way that the two chlorine atoms are trans to each other. So let's see what the point group assignment for this particular molecule is going to be. Um, we can recognize pretty quickly that if I look for a high order rotation axis that goes in the plane of the board, taking, for example, iodine to chlorine, that none of those works. So high order, highest order rotation axis along the xy plane is going to be C1 the identity. So that's nothing terribly interesting because that is always going to be there. Let's see if we can find another high order rotation axis. And I would notice that the uh, drawing of the molecules fortuitous in this particular case, I can recognize that going along this particular axis, that there is a C2. So I can go along, for example, the Dow, if I twist the molecule, it would take chlorine in chlorine, this chlorine would go into that chlorine. 
So we have a C2 high order rotation axis. Do we have any mirrors? Well, since I have a square planar compound, I recognize that I have a mirror in the plane of the board. So there's one mirror there. And I have an additional mirror that goes vertically that reflects the left side of the molecule into the right side. So again, we notice even though we've changed the substitution pattern, we've come back to, again, another example of C2V. One of my favorite jokes to tell students is that if you have a molecule for which you cannot figure out the point group assignment, that it's always a good idea, in that case, to guess C2V because C2V is a very common point group. And it's the point group of water, so that's a useful thing to remember. So let's make one more change in the substitution pattern, and let's replace one of the chlorines with fluorine. So now I have four different halogens surrounding my platinum atom. And this has pretty much eliminated all of the rotational axes because if I put an axis along here, it would take fluorine into chlorine, which doesn't work. If I go diagonally, it would take fluorine into iodine, which doesn't work. If I go horizontally, it would take bromine into iodine, which doesn't work. If I try to go through the platinum, it would take iodine to chlorine or bromine or fluorine. None of those work. So there are no high order rotation axes higher than a C1. And we notice that it doesn't have inversion. And it seems, at first, to have no symmetry operations other than the identity. But it does have one. And keep in mind that we're looking at molecules which are square planar. Since it's entirely planar molecule, we do have a mirror in the plane of the board. And that tells us that the two symmetry operations we have are E and sigma for a mirror. So this tells us that we have the point group CS, where S stands for Spiegel. Now for a somewhat more three-dimensional example of the group D3H. We can look at an important compound, PF5. So this is phosphorus pentafluoride. And this is, has a structure which we call trigonal bipyramid. We notice that there is a planar section of a equilateral triangle of these three fluorines along the equatorial region of the molecule. And then above and below the plane, through the center, we have two other fluorines. And these are said to be in the axial positions. So these are in the axial positions. These three are in the equatorial position. And again, we have the point group D3H. And we have D3H because if we do a rotation, our high order rotation axis will be along this particular axis here. And that is a C3. That would take this fluorine to that fluorine, this fluorine to this one, and this one to this one. This fluorine, the phosphorus, and the fluorine at the bottom are all along the axis, so they're not affected by the rotation. If we were to rotate in the clockwise direction, we would get a, a similar looking molecule. It works the same way as if we had merely a triangle in the center. Uh, again, if we were looking for where the mirror planes are going to be, in the plane of the triangle here, that's where our horizontal mirror is going to be because it is perpendicular. Can you make a note of this? So that it's perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. So that is where our sigma h is going to be for this particular compound. And then we have a series of sigma v's. And so our vertical mirrors are going to go through phosphorus. The first of the, and every one of them is going to go through the phosphorus and the two axial fluorines. The only difference is going to be there's be a, one additional fluorine is going to be in each vertical mirror. So one of the vertical mirrors would include this fluorine, 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 and phosphorus along there. The second one would include this fluorine, phosphorus, fluorine, fluorine. And then the third would be through here. So we go through this fluorine, 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 and phosphorus. So if we go through all the symmetry operations of D3H, we would notice that we've met the requirements of the group. Last but not least, since we're naming it as a D group, we know that there has to be at least one C2 that's going to be perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. So let's show where that is. Well, if we draw C2 through here, C2 along this particular axis, so it's going to go through the phosphorus and one of the fluorines, 
And the effect of this symmetry operation would be to take this fluorine to that fluorine, one axial fluorine to the other axial fluorine. So those two axial fluorines will be uh, permuted, they'll be switched. This fluorine and phosphorus are along the axis so they don't change. And we notice that this particular C2 axis is perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. And it would have to because this C2 goes through the horizontal mirror. The horizontal mirror is perpendicular to it. So the, any line through it has to be perpendicular as well. We could find two others. For example, we could find a C2 that goes along like this and the third C2 would go this way. But we know that once we found one of the C2s that's perpendicular to the high order rotation axis, we know that the other ones have to be there. So we can go through and notice that uh, the treadle by pyramid where all the substituents are the same is an important case of the D3H uh, point group. So let's see if we can change this molecule and still keep it as the same point group. So let's first make some substitutions that keep the point group the same, and then we're going to look at some substitutions which will change the point group. So again, we keep phosphorus in the center, and we can continue to think of this as being substituted by halogens. So let's put in here. Now, if I substitute both of the axial positions to a new halogen, so let me put iodine here, so now we have a new compound. So we have PF3 I2. But we want to figure out what is the point group of this particular molecule. And we'd see again that if we look for the high order rotation axis going along the axis of the molecule, it would take fluorine to fluorine, fluorine to fluorine, fluorine to fluorine. So we still have a C3. The iodines and the phosphorus are along the axis, so they're not affected by it. So we still have our C3, and then we want to see, um, do we have a mirror plane? Well, we have a mirror in the plane of the fluorines, and it's going to reflect iodine into iodine, and the fluorines into themselves, so we still have that mirror plane. Do we have a C2? Well, again, the C2 would be, for example, along through here. This might be a C2 axis. Let's see if that really is a C2. We notice that the effect of this C2 axis is to swap the two iodines, so that changes iodine into iodines, okay. It's going to keep phosphorus and fluorine the same because they're along the axis, and it's going to swap this fluorine and that fluorine. So we see that we still have a C2 that's perpendicular to the high order rotation axis. And since that's true, we can have the point group D3H. So we see that when we have trigonal by pyramid, it isn't necessarily absolutely true that all five substituents have to be exactly the same, in order to have the group D3H. But we do have that both the axial positions have to be identical. So let's do some variations on this and see what other point groups we can generate by substitution. So the first example is the end use an intermediate of the two that we've used so far, let me have one fluorine, but switch the other one to iodine. So now only one of the axial positions is going to be iodine and one is going to be fluorine. Well, do we have a C3 rotation? Well, if I again rotate along this axis, it's going to take fluorine into fluorine, fluorine into fluorine, fluorine into fluorine. So we do have the C3. So the C3 has not been affected by changing the axial positions of the trigonal bipyramid molecule. But let's look at the mirror plane. Well, if we're looking for a horizontal mirror, that would be the plane of this equilateral triangle. It would have to reflect fluorine into iodine. Nah, it doesn't work. So that means we don't have a mirror going from here to there. So the mirror plane that would have been, if it had been a mirror plane, that is perpendicular to the high order rotation axis is not there. So we don't have a horizontal mirror in this case. Let's see if we have a C2. Let's see if we can even have a D group. Well, if I try to put a axis along here, for example, that would flip fluorine into fluorine, which is okay, but it would also flip iodine into fluorine, and that's not going to work. So if we go along this, turn the molecule over, it's like turning over an egg timer, a uh, sand timer, it's going to swap iodine and fluorine. So we don't have a C2. 
So we do not have a D group even. But we know that we have C3 as our high order rotation axis. We want to see if we have any other mirrors. And we notice that we do. So we have, going through fluorine and phosphorus, I can have a mirror that's going to go fluorine, iodine, phosphorus, fluorine. So I can actually have a mirror plane because it's going to reflect fluorine into fluorine. That's going to work. So I have a uh, vertical mirror going that way. Also going through this phosphorus, as the phosphorus, fluorine, fluorine, and iodine. That's a second vertical mirror. And then the third vertical mirror would include fluorine, fluorine, phosphorus, and iodine. So we're going to have three vertical mirrors. So that tells me that this molecule belongs to the point group C3V. Let's see if we can make any other interesting permutations on this. Let's see if we can, what happens if we change the equatorial positions. So I change the equatorial position. Let me change this to something like bromine. Do I have a C3 anymore? Well, if I have a C3, it's going to rotate fluorine to fluorine, which works, but it would also rotate fluorine into bromine, which does not work. So we no longer have a C3. So C3 is gone. Let's see if we have a C2. Well, if I try to have C2 along here, that would take fluorine into fluorine, which works, but would also take fluorine into iodine, which doesn't work. So we don't have a C2 in that particular direction. Let's see, what else do we have? Okay, so we have, um, along this way, we don't have any C2s. We have, so the higher order rotation axis is a C1. So that's all we have is C1, which tells us that we have the E operation. But let's look for mirrors. Well, we notice that we don't have a mirror in the plane of the equilateral triangle because that would reflect fluorine into iodine. But do we have any vertical mirrors? And look, it turns out we do. If we have a mirror that goes between the fluorines and through the bromine, it also goes through the middle of the iodine and through the middle of the fluorine. I'm going to show that this way. So it reflects one half of each of those into the cells. So that's going to work. It's going to reflect fluorine to fluorine, goes right through the phosphorus, goes right through the bromine, right through the iodine, and right through the fluorine. So those don't count. So since it reflects fluorine into fluorine, I do have a mirror. And the only symmetry operation that we have for this particular molecule is going to be the mirror plane. So that tells us that the point group we have is going to be CS. So that is the only mirror plane, uh, the only symmetry operation we have. So therefore it belongs to the point group CS. That's all we're going to look at as far as uh, symmetry point groups related to D3H for the time being. But be sure to subscribe. Thank you for your attention. Have a good one. Be sure to subscribe. Thank you for your attention. Have a good one.